Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, last part of our lecture. Gotta go through everything. Good, here we go. Up to survivorship. And, okay, so we're talking about the survivorship bias and why we shouldn't listen to survivors, you know, the advice of the survivors. And what I'm really trying to get at is the effect of, and I've been using the term luck, and a lot of people say I shouldn't be using the term luck because uh, it really, I should be talking about random uh, probability uh, or uh, probability. Uh, I probably use the term luck because I don't really feel there is luck. That is some type of, you know, positive luck that happens especially to you. Uh, so therefore, it's all probability to me. But a lot of people say, oh, you know, uh, luck. People think that you know you have luck because something out is watching to, you know, watching out over you. Uh, you know, so I should use random probability. When you want to talk about random probability, oh, I need my pen. You should talk about Jacob Bernoulli. Uh, Jacob Bernoulli uh, lived back then, and he developed most of what we know about probability. Uh, so everything that you're learning in probabilities, you know, Math 111 and Psych Stats, really he discovered. And uh, you know, just a brilliant person. Uh, you know, and he was the first person to really run across it. And you know, and you may recognize the Bernoulli trials that you learn in, in Math 111. And uh, you know, I found this one very interesting uh, quote from him: "One should not appraise human action on the basis of results. One should not appraise human action on the basis of results. That is, you shouldn't you know, evaluate a person's action by the results of the action." What? Let me break that down uh, for you. So an action may be wise or unwise. That is, it may be adaptive or effective or, you know, unadaptive or ineffective. Uh, but any action, wise or foolish, is separated by their, uh, from their results by some probability of success. Uh, that is, doing something does not guarantee results 100% of the time. There's always some probability. Uh, studying hard versus acing an exam or passing an exam. Uh, yeah, it's a wise thing to study hard for an exam, but that doesn't guarantee you a, one, uh, you know, a 100 on the exam uh, you know, with a probability of a sure thing. There's always a probability of success. So, what he means is even the wisest action is separated from its results by a probability. And so they're judging a person by the outcomes or results of their action is just judging a person based on random chance. We're not saying anything about the person, we're just talking about their random chance, their probabilities. So given that, let me go through an example to really bring home when, uh, b what Bernoulli was talking about. So uh, let me delve into the survivorship bias and give you my survivor's advice on how to become a college professor. So I'm a college professor, I'm a survivor, so uh, let's talk about you know my advice. My advice is, uh, well what I did was I switched majors in college, so uh, I think that helped me, so I'm going to suggest that. Uh, I had my options open when applying to graduate school. I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And so I applied to a couple different types of graduate schools. That you know was different what I did, so I remember that. Uh, so maybe that helped. Uh, I worked with different professors in graduate school. I definitely remember that, so maybe that helped. Uh, I also had some non-academic experience. I was outside of academia uh, for a while and I was also an adjunct for a while. And all of these things, I think, helped me become the professor I am. So anybody who wants advice on how to become a professor, uh, do these things. 
Okay, so, uh, you know, what we're talking about here is applying for ac uh, graduate school and applying for academic jobs. And, you know, here are the things that I suggest in order to, uh, uh, you know, help you uh, get into graduate school. And here are the things I suggest to help you uh, get an academic job. However, uh, these actions do not guarantee you success. If you do one of these things, there's a probability of a success or a failure. So even doing one of these things will not guarantee that you'll get into graduate school. Uh, likewise, once you have your degree, getting an academic job is difficult. Uh, so these do not guarantee success. There's a probability of success or failure. And so even if you do all these things I suggest, uh, you may not succeed. Also, because I'm a survivor, oh, I want to talk more about probability. That's what I want to do with this slide. So you think about the probabilities. Uh, and let's count up the probability. So uh, the probability that you graduate from college. So you know, there's a given probability. What do you think the probability is in general that somebody who starts finishes college? Well, let's say that it's you know 50%. So really, uh, you're looking over you know your plans in life, and you say, well, I want to be a college professor. Well, first I have to go to college and graduate. And you know, of course, because you have the self-serving bias and all these self-esteem-related biases to see yourself positively, the optimistic bias, you're going to say, well, of course I'll graduate from college. But if you want to think about this objectively. Uh, there's a probability that you will grad graduate and then go on to the next step, or there's a probability that you won't and you'll be out of the whole uh, process. And we can set that to whatever it is, and so then, you know, 50% maybe. So, yeah, okay, so there's a 50% chance that I'll get to the next step. And then that's after college, will I be financially able to apply to graduate school? Will I have the money to you know, pay $150 per application, uh, you know, uh, you know, et cetera, so on? Will I have the money to go to graduate school? And that's a probability also. If you fail, you're out. And if you pass, you're accepted. And you get accepted, and there's another probability. Once you're accepted into graduate school, What's the probability that you'll either not do well and drop out, or you'll be a success? And then once you're a success, successful college gra or graduate school uh, graduate with a PhD, uh, you apply for a job as a professor. And again, that's a probability. And you either get the job or you don't. And there's some type of probability associated with that, no matter what you do. So even doing the best things possible in each one of these situations, there's still a probability that you will fail. And the point is, even if you have like a really high probability of you know, graduating from college, let's say that there's only a 2% chance that you're going to fail college. And let's say there's only a 2% chance that you won't be able to financially apply to graduate school. Let's say that there's, why did you stop there? A 2% chance that you'll fail at getting accepted into a graduate program, uh, which is really, you know, low. Uh, what if you have a 2% chance of failing and not succeeding at your graduate program. And let's say that there's a 2% chance that once you have your PhD, you apply for a college job and you don't get it. Well, these are all random probabilities. So 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, so uh, 2, let's see, 2 to 4, 8, 16. That's up to a 32% that starting off there's 
a 32% chance you won't get through down to the bottom, even if you're doing things that are so good that it has a preternatural low failure rate. And then another thing you have to worry about is listening to survivors. Uh, my advice to you was absolutely horrible. That's why it's crossed out. Uh, switching majors in college, bad idea. Uh, not really helpful in getting into graduate school. So I would not recommend it. Uh, keeping your job, uh, keeping your options open when applying to graduate school. You know, I was applying to both applied and basic social psych programs because I really didn't know. Bad idea. Uh, you should really have a specific focus when you're applying to graduate school, even down to who you want to work with for the next five years. Uh, applying for academic jobs, uh, working with different professors in graduate school, bad idea. You want to work in, with one professor, uh, churn out a lot of research on one topic, uh, get some publications. Uh, spending some time outside of academia, bad idea. Uh, and teaching as an adjunct, bad idea. I was talking to a graduate student uh, a week or so ago, and he told me that his advisor said, no, don't become, don't adjunct teach. It's like the kiss of death. So even if you listen to uh, somebody's good advice, which how do you know it's good advice? You don't really know, uh, you know, whether it's good or bad advice, but even if you listen to good advice, oops, there it is. You know, there's still a minute probability that you're going to fail at each step, and they add up. And so why did I, you know, present things like this? Uh, to really illustrate the problems with survivorship bias and listening to the advice of people. And the problem with survivorship bias and listening to advice has to do with what I already mentioned, which is your self-esteem and your self-concept and the effects on your memory, your autobiographical memory. Uh, that is, uh, you know, our self-esteem, and we generally want to maintain our self-esteem, uh, affects how we remember things. We forget things that don't support our self-esteem, and we remember things that do support our self-esteem. And so when you ask a survivor, about what uh, happened in their life and what they did, they'll remember things positively, but they don't will not remember negative things about uh, you know their uh, you know autobiographic uh, you know life. So uh, here's Bill's luck. That is, this is an alternate reading of what I was talking about, based on the idea that things just worked out well for me for no reason. The probabilities were in line. Uh, so things unrelated to me that were I was just lucky with or things unrelated to my ability or what I did uh, that just uh, held probability in my favor. Earlham, the good college that I went to, uh, and it certainly gave me a boost in all things, uh, think preferential attachment process, uh, Earlham needed physics majors. Uh, my father wanted me to be a physics major. I wasn't that crazy about it, but what I did was I put down physics as my uh, potential major, uh, and I was heavily recruited by Earl, uh, which was you know nice and complimentary, and made me consider them more than anything else, and probably made them more likely to accept me, uh, regardless of my okay GPA in high school. Uh, then getting into uh, graduate school. Uh, had a pretty good but not great uh, GPA in college. The graduate school I ended up in, Miami, uh, you know, that had another Earlham student recently go there and graduate, and Kip was, everybody loved him, uh, and everyone spoke highly of him, and so, you know, a lot of the things I heard is, oh, you know, Kip, you know, so-and-so went to Earlham, and he was a fantastic graduate student. So that had nothing to do with me or my choices. Uh, it was just random chance that worked out in my favor. Uh, Miami needed applied students. That is, Miami wanted to start an applied social psych program at that time. They didn't. 
uh, in the end. But the fact that I was interested in applied social psych certainly uh, positively biased them towards me. Uh, a graduate school advisor I had was sexist. And so uh, he was uninterested in working with his female graduate students and more interested in working with me. And that certainly benefited me. And then finally, York had a bad interview process in 2003. Uh, very informal, uh, which allowed me to capitalize on things uh, based on probability. So uh, these are the luck things that most people would not remember or not want to remember because their self-concept and their self-esteem would bias them to only think about self-laudatory things regarding their autobiographical history. Uh, I did this, uh, this soul searching or this uh, introspection uh, to illustrate the point that uh, you know, we have these random points in our life where we may succeed or we may fail. And uh, it's pretty much random. There are a lot of things working in our favor and a lot of things working against us. And we tend to remember the things that we did well. And we t tend to think, uh, forget about the things that don't really paint us in a good light. And so everybody has this type of personal history. They just haven't thought about it or will not share it. Uh, the point of this is not to show you how horrible a college professor I am or that I really don't belong here or that I didn't earn it. It's that everybody has these things in their background, not just me. And I'm only sharing this with you because I want you to recognize that. And so people have these negative things and positive things in their background. Some make it more likely that they will succeed, even though it has nothing to do with themselves. Uh, some uh, make it less likely that they'll succeed, even though they're trying really hard. But again, it gets back to Bernoulli's point that you shouldn't really judge a person by the outcome of their actions. So what would Bernoulli be happy with? Uh, he would want us to identify a key behavior. Uh, he'd like us to observe many trials across many times and many people. Uh, then he'd like us to see whether or not uh, the outcomes were successful or not. And we'd want to look at the statistical distribution of the outcomes. And we want to take into account randomness when we're looking at these statistical outcomes. And of course, one systematized way we do that is statistical significance. Uh, to make this more, uh, you know, concrete, I talked about, you know, the number of professors you should work with in graduate school, one. And so we identify that key behavior. Uh, the number of professors, that's pretty easy to count up. We just ask people that. We can't really observe people across times because, you know, in they only go to graduate school usually once. But we do look at this across many people. So really what I'm describing here is a correlational study. The predictor or the pseudo IV is the number of professors. And the DV is some indication of success as a college professor, the tier of the college you go on to teach at, uh, or the number of publications you have in 10 years, uh, both of which would be, you know, anyone would uh, accept as a measure of how successful you are as a college professor. Then we observe the t statistical distribution of the outcomes and we take into account randomness by calculating statistical significance or a confidence interval around uh, the correlational uh, measure that we get. And that brings us back to survivorship. So what I have to say about survivorship bias is that we need to watch out for it. Uh, we need to not really see successful people as really supermen or women, uh, but we have to see uh, them as they are, people who are at the end of a chain, a long chain, of several uh, key life points, uh, which have a probability of success and a probability of failure, 
and they're at the end of a brand of a set of branches where they had all these successes and there are some things that will help them out such as the preferential uh, attachment process uh, to help them continue with their successes uh, and uh, you may be thinking you know well what the heck am I talking about uh, if we can't trust experts or authorities who can we trust well uh, we can trust research and one of the reasons why I have been focusing on scientific research and controlled research studies in this class is that this is something that we can trust and uh, you know not just in psychology if you never take another psychology class I hope you understand that this is something that you could apply to your own personal life and you should that is you should look at uh, you know objective and controlled research studies on questions that you are trying to answer for your life uh, you know what type of uh, student loan should I take what type of uh, you know uh, mortgage should I have on my house should I rent or uh, should I buy should I lease a car uh, should I have an operation or not uh, you could trust authority figures you could trust successful people uh, or you could trust the research and my point is that you should trust research but then really we come down to the question well you're saying that we shouldn't trust successful people we shouldn't trust you know experts uh, but that's not that doesn't really sound American because in America you know people are you know leaders people are successful because they're they're right and because they're good and that idea is known as a meritocracy it's uh, where you base everything on merit merit that is like your hard work or your ability and so meritocracy is a political system in which money and power are distributed based on talent effort and achievement rather than wealth or social class and indeed America has this myth of being a meritocracy where we you know, reward people based on their merit but I said myth and that's an important you know word here uh, if it was a myth I mean if it uh, if uh, merit if America was a meritocracy we should see no relationship between uh, your parents income and your income that is if your income is based on your merit that is how hard you work how talented you are then it should be unrelated to how much money your parents had and as we can see here there is a relationship and the correlation at some points in this curve are point three point, uh, you know so that's a moderate size correlation so there is a moderate causal relationship between uh, you know the income that your parents earned and the income that you earned that is your income is not based solely on your talents and an effort and hard work it's based on where you started out and another you know more powerful example powerful example here's your parents income rank and here's the probability that you attended college and the correlation or the slope here is much stronger 0.6 uh, which means that the more money your parents had the more likely you would go to college and college is very instrumental in having a good life with a lot of money and resources and power access to power and so again we see that uh, America really isn't is not a meritocracy uh, it's really your standing in life is based on your the wealth that you begin with in your family and that belief that myth has some negative impact on you know people uh, this is from child development last year it's a study done looking at uh, beliefs about the fairness of the American system and that's essentially your beliefs in meritocracy and it's the beliefs that children espoused in the sixth grade and the effects on self-esteem and behavior over the next couple of years 
and this was done specifically on diverse low-income uh, students in a uh, city in an urban setting and what they found was that your belief in meritocracy was associated with high self-esteem less delinquent behavior and better classroom behavior in the sixth grade but then after that it drops off and the more that you believed in the meritocracy in the sixth grade the worse your self-esteem becomes over the next two years the worse your classroom behavior comes over the next two years and the more likely you uh, are to engage in delinquent criminal behavior over the next two years and what they suggest is when you're in the sixth grade you know you're just a kid uh, you're told that well in America you know your talent you'll be rewarded based on your talent and your ability and in the sixth grade you believe it but then as you start getting older you start to have more experience in the world and you see that well that's really not true some people are getting ahead without really uh, you know putting in the hard work or you know being that smart and this causes significant problems psychologically uh, over the next couple of years and probably uh, it continues on the two years in this study uh, to the rest of their lives. That is, people who really do need the help of society are being told this myth and believing in this myth actually causes negative consequences to their motivation and behavior which prevent them from uh, rising up based on their talents or their actual behavior. Uh, so this belief in this myth of a meritocracy in America is actually toxic to some people, the people who need it the most. Okay, so uh, this is the second attempt on this lecture. The first one uh, was not recorded uh, or you know the, the recording program crapped out, so I hope you're going to hear this one. I don't know if I could record a third one today. Uh, take care.